First Timothy 5.21 is a verse that is loaded with important meaning. It speaks to more than one issue. Let's read it very carefully. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus and his chosen angels. Again, as we've always pointed out, when you see Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ, it's the Lord Jesus in eternity. It's him in eternity, not on earth. Now this tells us that what we declare, what we state, is heard in heaven before God. If you tell somebody something, God knows it. The angels, angelic beings know it. Jesus knows it. Your voice is heard in heaven. That's a powerful thing. That's a powerful thing. Whether or not God pays attention to our prayers or not is another matter. Uh, he will in Christ. But our voice is heard. This relates to the passage that tells us we will be accountable for every word. Every word has been registered in heaven. It's all recorded. It's all there. When we say something, we better take into account that it's not just something we're saying on earth. It's something we're saying in heaven. Secondly, let's look at it more carefully now. His chosen angels, electos. This speaks of the issue of election. Just as in human election, there is angelic election. Most scholars, theologians, have agreed that as best we can determine from Scripture, one-third of the angels followed Satan in his rebellion against the Lord when Satan thought he could usurp the place of God. Satan was such a per perfect being that it was the closest God could have come without replicating himself. Jesus, of course, is the replication of God, except that he was pre-existent, but in his human form, he was the image and likeness of God incarnate. Now, Satan tries to usurp a third of the angels, follow him, two-thirds do not. Demons are simply the fallen angels, that's all they are. But they retain the same angelic power, although restrained by God's hand up to a degree. The other angels are the chosen ones. But let's understand this. Just as with people, as we see in Romans, the elect are always corporate. I am not elect. You are not elect. We are elect. For the sake of the elect, it's always corporate. What the Calvinists do is take something that is speaking corporately and misapply it to individuals. This one's elect, this one isn't, this one's elect, this one isn't. We are the elect. The elect are guaranteed salvation. You remain part of the elect. You have eternal security. If you depart, you need to repent and get back in the club. Your insurance policy has expired. You better renew it and come back to Jesus and repentance. To have the assurance of salvation, you'll be in the elect. Well, with the angels, it's the same thing. God did not elect some angels for eternal damnation for the lake of fire and others to be with him forever in eternity as his messengers and his servants and so forth and worshipers. No, no. The election of angels, like the election of people, is based on what they did or did not do. Those angels who did not follow Satan in rebellion, elected. Those who went into the rebellion of Satan and tried to usurp the place of God, are not elected. Same as us. God's election is never arbitrary. He doesn't make some for eternal perdition and some for eternal glory, blessing, grace, love, etc. It's not like that. The election of angels is like the election of men. It's corporate, and it is predicated on their own choice, their own action. Let's continue looking further at this very important verse. 
maintain these principles without bias. Again, we are told three times in the book of Proverbs, three times, an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. Differing weights and measures are an abomination to him. He's a God of justice. Looking further, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. God's laws apply to all of us. We cannot make exceptions for certain people among us, and we cannot make exceptions for ourselves. We must seek to live accordingly. That's what that verse is saying. In specific answer to your question, the angels who God has chosen are the ones who chose him, who did not rebel against him in the Meted, the great rebellion of Satan. Now we read about Satan and what he did and so forth in the book of Ezekiel and in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14 being a very important chapter where the king of Babylon, who is a type of the Antichrist, is also a metaphor for Satan. We also have the king of Tyre uh, in, in Ezekiel explaining the nature of Satan's rebellion and what he did. As best as scholars have ever been able to work out in this generally agreement, one-third of the angels followed Satan in his rebellion. Two-thirds did not. The elect angels are the angels who remained faithful to the Lord and did not participate in the rebellion. The two-thirds who are not fallen. Those are the elect angels, the electos, the ones who were chosen by God or the ones who did not rebel against him. That is the best of my understanding, and it's the best of the understanding of anyone of whom I'm aware. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings to your friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Parpezzo, Parpezzo what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.